Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, everybody. Uh, let's start. Our speakers today are Nick Lawrence and Jen Jen Chung from uh, currently um, Oregon State University. Uh, they did their PhDs at the um, Australian Center for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney, uh, and that's where they did their um, uh, autonomous soaring work, which they're going to be talking about today. Please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I guess Andre's already given us a pretty good introduction. Um, he said all this already, basically. but. Um, so we both did uh, engineering, aeros uh, aerospace engineering bachelors at the University of Sydney, and then PhDs at the Center for Field Robotics in Sydney. Um, and then I did a, a postdoc for Qantas for a couple of years, and then about 18 months ago we moved to the US to Oregon State University. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background, kind of what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk first, and then Jen and I'll finish up. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some soaring background. So some of the early work I did was just the flight mechanics of soaring um, and what that looks like from the aircraft's point of view. And then I'll talk about some of the early work we did with actually trying to generate path planning type techniques to, to do autonomous soaring. And then how do you integrate this into a wider mission? And that was work I did with a PhD student, Joe. And then Jen is going to talk about a kind of reinforcement learning approach to that problem. So I think if you want to have questions during it, you can just interrupt me. I guess it's, it's a small enough group, but that's OK. Um, so I'll start with a bit of soaring background. I don't know how familiar everybody is with soaring. But basically, when I talk about soaring, what I mean is capturing energy from the wind in flight. So you have an aerial vehicle. There are some structures in the wind. And if you fly in certain ways inside those structures, you can actually collect energy as you fly. And that's what soaring is. Um, and this is not a new invention. This was actually discovered a long time before even manned aircraft exist. So very early work in aeronautics or in um, flight mechanics, people kind of understood that drag existed, and they knew how lift worked. And they knew that in order to fly, there was some drag cost, and you had to be losing energy. So to keep flying, you had to be adding energy back into the system. And most birds do this by flapping. But they noticed that some birds, especially large birds, seem to be able to fly for really long periods of time without flapping. And so they're interested in how exactly they could do that. And their uh, kind of hypothesis with, was that they were collecting energy from the wind. And they identified these types of soaring. So from that point, soaring kind of got split into these two kind of component definitions. So the first one is called static soaring. And that's basically inside a thermal. So you have some kind of feature on the ground, uh, and it's heated by the sun. And then that convects into the air above it. And that air rises relative to all the surrounding air. And you get a, a kind of column of rising air. So you get, or a bubble. So sometimes you get these, these like recirculating bubbles where the air is moving around. Um, but basically, the air is moving up relative to the air around it. And if you fly inside there, you can actually collect energy. Um, the second definition, or the second component, is what's known as dynamic soaring. And that happens due to spatial gradients in the wind. So in this case, you have something like uh, over, let's say, a flat surface like the ocean, and you have a prevailing wind. You have a no-slip condition at the surface. So you have to have zero velocity down here. And you have some kind of wind at some altitude above it. So you've got uh, like a spatial gradient of wind that goes from zero to some magnitude at some other altitude. Uh, and basically, by flying certain patterns inside here, you can actually collect energy. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about how you do it in the next slide. But this is something. Basically, this occurs most often over land, because you get this uh, distribution of heating. Um, and this happens, can happen in lots of places. But it's usually used by birds over the sea. So things like albatrosses use it so to travel really long distances over the ocean. And also, in the remote control world, you get ridge soaring, where um, if you have a, a geographic feature like a ridge and you have wind blowing over it, you get a really steep gradient just behind the ridge, where you've got kind of slow moving air and then fast moving air over the top. So you get Great, it looks like this, but generally much sharper. So this seems like a really useful thing to do, and especially for UAVs. So traditionally, for a fixed wing UAV, the amount of time it can fly is limited by its capacity for onboard energy. So that's usually in the form of batteries or fuel. In order to fly, you need, to propul uh, you need some form of propulsion, and you want to consume all that energy. Um, and that limits how long you can fly. But if you could collect energy during flight, it would be really useful, because you can fly for long distances or potentially indefinitely by collecting the energy that's available in the atmosphere. 
Um, so the early research in, in UAV soaring revolved mostly around what was already really well understood for manned gliders and for RC gliders. So manned gliders use what are essentially a set of heuristics about how to collect energy from a thermal. And they're really simple. So you kind of fly along, and they have a, a sensor that measures the airspeed and the rate of climb. And it basically it beeps. And when it beeps more, you kind of turn left. Like you might turn into it. And when it beeps less, you, you turn away from it or the other way around. Um, and what that does is it tends to center you around a thermal. So you know this thermal is a column. And as you fly through it, you start to rise. So you turn a little bit. And eventually, you end up in a spiral, like you saw over here where you're flying around inside the rising air and actually collecting energy. So the early work did similar things. You used really similar sets of rules to try and do this with an autonomous soaring glider. Uh, so some of the early demonstrations were a guy called Michael Allen, and he was at NASA Dryden, so this was uh, 2007. And he basically showed that that kind of works. If you use these simple rules and thermals are available, you can actually collect energy from them. And this work was continued by a guy called Dan Edwards a few years later, so it was 2010. Um, and he did his PhD on really trying to apply this and to, to travel long distances. And he demonstrated a flight of 97 kilometers and a flight lasting for three and a half hours. So that's pretty impressive. So that's, that's a long way, and that thing is clearly collecting energy. And that ended up being kind of competitive with, hu with human pilots. Uh, so that was a, a really impressive display of what's possible. So with this, I was interested in what, what actually happens from the aircraft's point of view when it's soaring. Um, so I looked at this firstly, if you just look at the kind of longitudinal axis, you know, the aircraft's pretty simple. You've got lift and drag and weight. And then if you look at all of the air components, you might have some bits due to wind. And if you kind of go through this model, you can end up backing out this specific power equation. So this term over here is the rate of energy, which is just power, and I've normalized it by mass. But basically, what you get is this equation at the bottom. And it has three really important components. And it breaks it down nicely into those definitions we saw earlier. So the first component is the energy loss to drag. Basically, anything moving through a fluid uh, suffers from drag. And that's some energy loss. And you, you lose it. The, the faster you go, the more energy you lose. Uh, and that's something you can't really do anything about. Uh, the second term is the static soaring term. And this is really simple. It's basically just got proportional to the vertical wind speed. So z is the, the vertical direction. So if you have some vertical wind, and it, it's basically moving your whole frame of reference up. You know, you're still flying down relative to the wind, but you're moving this whole parcel of air upwards, then you can collect energy from there. Um, and the last term is the static, uh, the dynamic soaring term. So that's this one on the right. And this one's interesting because this is all to do with the gradients of the wind. So I have this kind of wind Jacobian, which I've drawn little pictures of what each of the components are. But you know, you, you have wind that's changing in space. So this first component is the, the change in the x direction of wind with, with x. So you know, it has to be changing x velocity as you move forward. And all of these components are expressed in some way through here. So you can look at, depending on how fast you're moving through them and the magnitude of these gradients, you can be gaining or losing energy due to actual spatial gradients in the wind. So I, I kind of wanted to look at the right conditions for this. So uh, it's not very useful to look at these plots. But basically, you can, you can look at what climb angles give you the, the best amount of power. So given a kind of wind magnitude, how should I actually try and fly through it to collect energy? So in order to apply this, the, the first thing I did was Sure. The angle that you're looking at, does yeah. it depend upon the airframe? or? Yeah, so the little a is because it's air relative. Okay. So I've put these, well, these extra components in here. So normally, your climb angle might just be due to your you know, inertial velocities. But this is actually your air relative climb, which is a little bit different. Um, if you know what the wind is, you, you could measure it. But yeah, it is, it is actually different. So you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, one of the simplest ways to collect energy from the static soaring t uh, from the dynamic soaring term is this thing called a rally cycle, um, and basically it's got some simple components. So I I've plotted over here what the kind of energy space looks like, so how the energy changes over time, and these are a description of what happens. And you have a, a set of kind of components in here. So if you start down the bottom with some amount of energy, first thing you do is climb upwind through this gradient, and so as you're climbing. Because the wind is increasing towards you, you're actually getting an increased airspeed. So you're collecting um, potential energy because you're climbing, and you're actually getting air relative kinetic energy because your airspeed is actually increasing. So you get to the top of this, 
but then you've got to do something with that energy. So if you turn around and start facing downwind, which is the second section at the top, you know, you're going to lose a little bit of energy because you slowed down just due to drag. But then on the way back down the other side, so now you've got a big tailwind at the beginning. And as you dive through this thing, you're losing all of your potential energy and converting it back into kinetic. But you're also getting some extra because kind of in reverse to what was happening when you went up one side, as you go down the other side, the, the tailwind is decreasing. So you're actually gaining even more kinetic energy. So you come down the bottom here, and you're traveling really fast. And then you turn around. And if at the end of that, you have more energy than you started with, um, then you can actually use that energy to do something. So this is a kind of simulation of an aircraft. Uh, and what I did was a really simple mode controller. So there's basically um, PID controllers in each one of these, and it just switches. So it says, OK, when I finish the climb, I'll do my turn. And it's trying to do a little bit of estimation of what the gradient is in order to get the best angle when it's climbing. Um, and you know, at the end of this, you might start, if you actually gained more energy, you probably have a bit more kinetic energy. Usually, you don't just want to speed up infinitely, so you can use it to travel and do other things. Um, so that was basically the simplest kind of dynamic soaring I could, I could get to work. Is there any mention of like the vertical components of the winds? I mean, all this just purely this, horizontal? Yeah, so this is only considering lateral winds. Okay. And only in one direction. So we just have a, a linear shear, like in this picture, um, going from something to something else. So can, can we just say that like, if there is constant wind going, you can pretty much use this to stay in the air forever? So if, yep, uh, if, if this gradient is, is there all the time, then yeah, you can just keep going. So if you end this cycle, and that's what I drew here, you can actually start to travel upwind. So if, there, if you have sufficient energy, you can just keep doing this. And that's what the birds are doing over the sea. Because the sea is flat, there's usually a, a boundary layer. And they, the key thing is that these boundary layers are most well-developed or have the highest gradient. So to get, get energy, you want this gradient to be steep. And they're steepest closest to the surface. So you really want to fly really close to the ground. Um, but most people don't have aircraft that they want to test this on <laughs> close to the ground, because it, it scares the people who paid for it. Um, so we, we don't fly this. <laughs> to be close to the ground? because uh, It's basically just because of the boundary layer. So the boundary layer usually looks like this curve, um, kind of like this. And you really want maximum gradient. So oh, the, the best wow. gradients at the bottom, by the time you get up here, a constant wind doesn't help you. You need, a, you need a, some gradient. Yeah, you need gradient. And you want to maximize the gradient. And the best gradient is close to the surface, just because that's the way the boundary layer forms. So what altitudes are we talking about? So these are kind of like 15 meters. Like small, so the the birds are really on the low, the really close to the surface. And if you see them, they you know they nearly touch the water every time they do one of these cycles. So that's they clearly know something. But yeah, that's scary when it's your plane. <laughs> uh, so we don't <laughs> do that. Um, so with that, that was kind of nice, but it was really hand tuned. You know, I built this controller to to solve this problem. But the interesting thing was, if we look at that power equation, what we want to do is is learn behaviors from that thing directly. So we want to be able to generate trajectories that gain energy kind of if they know what the wind is, but not have to be tuned to do it specifically. So the, the simplest thing I could think of was to use um, kind of a tree-based planner. Basically, you, you sample a bunch of control options, turn left, turn right, you know, go up and down. And then you do a really simple energy-based search. You say, which one of these options gave me the, the most energy or the best power, and you just you go ahead in time. And so if you know the wind, uh, you can get, I'll start the videos again. So the bottom left one is a thermal. It kind of gives you what you'd expect, which is this climbing spiral through the thermal. So it's, it's, it's doing what you want it to do. And then in the shear layer, it kind of does something that looks a bit like a dynamic soaring cycle, but it's not particularly good. And the challenging part about this is that you really need to plan over quite long horizons, because during that cycle, some of it you're gaining energy, but some of it you're losing energy. So just trying to greedily optimize doesn't work very well, uh, which is not surprising, but it, it doesn't make it any easier. So this kind of worked, um, but it assumed that you knew what all the wind was. So in planning that, it assumed that it could access you know, the complete wind model, and then it could build a trajectory. So we had this problem where we knew we wanted to soar. So that's something we know we want to do. And we knew that if we had a good map of the wind, we can generate reasonable trajectories. The problem is, to generate a map of the winds, you need a map. 
And to generate a map, you have to collect samples. And the hard thing about air is to collect samples, you have to actually go and visit it. So you, there is not really good remote sensing for measuring the wind from an aircraft. So to collect energy, you need to go and sample it. But that costs you energy because <coughs> you actually have to go and visit it. So you have this constant cycle of using all your energy to get a good map and then using that map to actually collect energy. So it's a really nice, I think, definition of an exploration exploitation problem. So to try and approach this, we, we basically used the planner you saw previously. We need to solve this mapping problem. Uh, we used a, a method called Gaussian process regression. Uh, I guess I won't talk about it too much, but it's basically um, if you take noisy samples of some continuous field and you want to work out the uncertainty, so rebuild a map of what that is and also get some measure of how confident you are in regions of the map, um, then that helps you work out the bits that you're relatively confident you have a good map and areas that you, you're not sure whether you have a good map. Yeah, good question on the GC module. Sure. Are you, since vector, wind is a vector field, yep. so are you having like multiple GPs for different components? Yeah, so we basically so split them apart. Um, and I think there is definitely something to be said for trying to do that as a multi-output GP, but it gets bigger and much more complicated when you have just multiple X, outputs. Y, or X and Y? Yeah, X, Y, Z. Okay. Yeah. So then you just you split them out, and then when you want to look up the wind, you just sample each one of them. Um, so now we know we want to explore. In order to get a good map, we want to exploit to collect energy. So I kind of made this uh, <coughs> simple technique where you choose a target based on that. If I and I use the, the current energy of the aircraft to decide. So I say if I have low energy, so if I'm near the bottom and I need to collect more energy, I basically want to exploit. So I go back to where I know the best energy that I found previously was, and I go and collect energy. If I've got high energy, so I'm somewhere up the top of the field, then I want to use that to go and explore. And in order to do that, I pick the, the area of the GP that has the highest uncertainty. So I just find the maximum uncertainty region, and I say I'm going to go there and sample. Um, so this is a video of what, what it looks like in simulation. So we have on the left, this plot is, is kind of busy, but all of the red X's are previous wind samples. So we just start it with some set of data. You'll kind of see that branching planner go out and it, it determines a plan and then it updates every time it, um, it executes one of those sections. And then the little X's indicate those two goals. So the, I think this is currently the exploration goal and the exploitation goal, which is the previously best energy. And the red circle is the one that it's currently going to. Um, and this thing on the right is the uncertainty model from the GP. So these surfaces are basically where it's blue, it has good information. Where it's red, it has less information. So you'll see as it flies around, it kind of cuts these tubes through there. But you'll see when the video starts. Um, and so there's a thermal, there's a little thermal over here that it has some information of. That's why the current goal is there. And there's a big one that it hasn't seen over to the left there. Um, so you can see it flies around and it, it does, so it's kind of switching between exploring and exploiting. So it'll come over here and use this thermal for a bit. Once it gets enough energy, it goes to find something else. At some point, it actually discovers this much better one. So from that point on, it keeps coming back over here. So it uses this good thermal and then it goes and explores. And really, the only thing it's trying to do is minimize uncertainty over the whole field. So it's just trying <laughs> to sample everywhere. Um, and the GP, GPs are not so good at lots of data, so it, um, cuts out points as it goes, and it, it pretty much spatially separates those. But it's really trying to get good coverage over the whole field. At what time scale is this all this happening? All, so all this is a sort of 500, so that was a 500 second mission. Uh, so this is actually a time series plot of that, the previous one. Um, and this is what the energy looks like. So you can see the, the green is the total energy. Uh, the kinetic and potential are, are quite hard to see, but potential energy kind of has to stay within these limits. We don't want it to go too high or too low. Um, and it goes through these alternating cycles. So when the green line's going up, it's usually in a thermal. You can see the beginning, the green lines are less steep because the thermal is not as strong. And then later, it finds these really good ones. So it kind of alternates between exploring and exploiting. Uh, the field variance, it's a GP, so this has to go down um, as you collect samples. But you know, it just shows that it is actually thinking it's getting a better estimate of the wind field. And so this is what the, the actual estimate looks like. So this is the true wind field, and this is its estimate, and the little cones are colored by how <laughs> uncertain it is. So it's done a pretty good job, and most importantly, it, it's confident and it's more accurate in the areas that have energy. Uh, so it, it tends to go there because it, it has to go there to collect energy all the time. 
So your model is, is stationary, right? You're assuming that the, you know, yes. the thermals don't go away. And, uh, so <laughs> the problem is that that model is stationary and thermals don't stay still. Um, in fact, the whole wind field drifts and moves around. So what we need to do next was to think a bit about what happens if this wind field is actually dynamic. Um, so fortunately, the, the GP can deal with with time relatively easily, you just add it as another dimension. Um, I did a little bit of work looking at separable versus non-separable, and basically that's just determining whether the, the spatial variation is related to the temporal variation or not. Um, so this video is, is kind of sampling this is the true wind field. I should pause it. Um, and it's trying to estimate that wind field over time. And so you'll see that the uncertainty kind of follows it around, so old data it, it's less confident in because it's old, and more recent data, it's more confident, and it's trying to move this thing in time. Um, yeah, so that, that's just a radial basis function, and then the, I tried a, a bunch of non-separable ones, but they're they're all still stationary. So I I did some non-stationary stuff with a, like a neural network kernel, but GPs are kind of magical. You just try some stuff, and you work out what works best. <laughs> so everybody is working with that all of it. <laughs> so when you add time as a dimension, so it's it's being appended to a feature, or you have a separate kernel for time, and then you are combining as a. Um, practically, it's a separate kernel. So because they are separable, um, they, in terms of their covariances, they are not really linked, but you still have to use the whole vector in order to predict across it. So it is, it is learning off you know, x, y, z, t. Um, but it's saying that there's not a relationship between the age of a data and where it was taken. Yeah. Sorry, another question. Sure. So you mentioned this issue with planning for dynamic soaring, that to do dynamic soaring well, you need to look far enough. Yeah. So knowing the wind field, I mean, doesn't, doesn't ultimately solve this That's problem right, by yeah. itself, right? So, yeah. Right, I manage to get it to work. So we did, really. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what happened is my planner is not very good. And the planner, as you saw, doesn't do well in dynamic soaring. It, it does OK when it can find things within its, its time horizon. But no, the short answer is I don't know. I don't know how to do a good job of planning over those long ones. You, you, could, you could hand code it, like in the, the first example, if you know what you're looking for. But in terms of a good generic planner for doing <coughs> dynamic soaring just based on a wind model, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't kind of done that. And how do you say, is, is the issue that the, is, it's expensive to sample these signals of controls? Yeah, basically, because this is rolling out a dynamic model, so you have to use your current estimate of the wind as well. You, you can't easily pre-compute all of your dynamics because they depend on the wind. And as you're measuring the wind, you need to use your own wind model. So you can't easily plan a long way ahead, because by the time you get there, you've collected data, the whole world's changed. Um, so you, you need to replan anyway. So yeah, basically, with that kind of model where you just, you're just rolling out a bunch of um, you know, samples, it's too expensive. But it doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. I, I, don't, I think that's probably the weakest part of this, is that planner. Um, given something that's a bit more intelligent, you could probably do a better job. Your samples are not completely random. You're not just sampling a random sample. No, definitely not. Right? Yeah. You're trying to plan for the for the for your assumed model. Yep. So you're trying to plan for the informative of that of that sample. You're trying yeah. to get the most informative samples. Um, and I do a little bit. I don't have it here about weighting towards um, the kind of likelihood of collecting energy because in a problem like this. If there's an area of wind that's relatively constant or zero, I don't really care about it because it's not going to help me anyway. So even though my uncertainty might be high, I still don't really want to sample there. So I have a little bit that tries to sample more towards areas that are, much, that are more likely to give me energy um, than areas that are less likely to give me energy. Uh, so what we did this in a dynamic, uh, oh, a dynamic. It's similar to the previous videos. Um, in this case, at the top, you have the true wind field. So we have this like sinusoidal variation. And then you've got two thermals. And the whole wind field is drifting. So another thing that I wanted to put in there was the drift. Because it's a wind feature, Things big wind features tend to drift together. You usually get some kind of whole motion. And you want to keep that without having to, to just assume that that's a function of time. You want to kind of estimate that. So I have a term in there that tries to estimate the drift of the field as well. 
Uh, but it's similar to the previous one, so you'll see it kind of flying around. And in the same way, the, the, the dots are the samples, and the colors are how confident it is. So in this case, you'll see that, that as these data get old, um, the uncertainty rises again because it, it gets less confident. But it's got a similar approach, so it finds this thermal, it exploits it, and then it tries to build samples around here. But this is really just an ongoing problem. You never finish. You just have to keep going because all the time your data is getting old. So it, eventually it discovers the second thermal. It keeps flying around. Um, so this is nice, but it's not really using. So the big problem, and I guess I'll get to that, is this is assuming you have pretty good wind information. So I add noise to the wind measurements, but we still don't really know whether you can get good enough wind measurements that this would actually work. And that's something that's still a challenge. The the pit controller, the Yeah, so that, that uh, sampling strategy is basically sampling from a range of PID controllers. So each one of those is associated with a controller that just kind of turns left or turns right or goes straight. Um, and it's, it's sampling all of those trajectories. Obviously, it doesn't always do quite what it thinks it does. And that's, the PID is good for that because it's just feedback. It'll, it'll try and keep a bank angle or something like that. Um, so what we're interested then is those previous problems, although they covered the soaring side of things, usually you want to, well, the likelihood is that you'd want to do something else besides soaring. Just soaring for the sake of soaring is, is probably not that useful. You usually want to do something else. So we were interested in looking at a higher level if you had some other mission. And in this case, it's searching for a lost ground target. Um, how do you generate plans that allow you to keep flying but actually finish the task that you're trying to achieve? So this picture here uh, will relate to the, to the next few slides. So I'll try and explain it. But basically, what we have here is we have uh, a prior map over things that we think are interesting <coughs> in the environment. So let's say we're looking for a lost ground target, and we have a prior over where we think it could be. These black regions are regions where the likelihood is high that the target is. So there's, a, there's one It's a bit hard to see because it's off the edge. But there's one up here. So it could be there, it could be there, it could be there. And what we want to do is search all of these areas and you know, maximize the probability of actually detecting this thing. So this is a really big problem. And it was hard from a planning point of view because there are so many options all the time. And it's, you know, it's continuous, but you've got these kind of discrete choices to do with thermals. So what we did is we cast it as a, basically a graph search problem by realizing that while you're doing this mission, you're always either you're always flying between two thermals. So you come from a thermal, and you're flying to another thermal. And on the way, so on this kind of interthermal path, you may be trying to get down towards to, to look at this target, or you might just be trying to travel between them. And you, you might come back to the same one, but it doesn't really matter. So what we realized is that there's not that many ways you can do that. So if you look at some pair of thermals, so this is a thermal A over here and a thermal B, and I want to travel between them. The thing that I can do that minimizes energy is to fly in a straight line between them, assuming nothing else happens in between. You know, if I fly in a straight line, that's the minimum amount of energy I can use to get from one thermal to another. But I might have more energy, so I could use that to maybe go and look for this thing. So let's say I, this is the area that I actually want to sample. I'll take this original path, and we put some points on there, and then we deform it towards this um, region that we're looking for. We keep deforming it until we run out of energy. So this is the point where I start with the max amount of energy and I end with the minimum. This is kind of the longest path I can take that, that collects the most amount of information. So now I have this family of paths. So I can take a couple of points out of here and say, well, there's the minimum one, there's someone that trades off a little bit between them, and there's one that maximizes them. And from that point, this looks a bit more like a tree search problem. So if I start here, I've got some set of paths that go to C and some set of paths that go to B. And from that point, you know, they have some set of paths. So sorry, I should say that the, the circles around these thermals indicate how far you could go and get back to the same ones. That's your kind of coverage region. So you couldn't fly from A all the way to H without going via something else. Um, so if you think about it, this is a, now it's, it's much easier because it's a graph search problem. You just look at all of the options you've got and try and sample down the tree. So the first thing we did was this finite horizon tree search. So it's, it's got a depth of, let's say, three, three thermals ahead. And it looks for all of the options, and it picks the best one. And then it executes the first one and replans. Um, and the problem with this, so this works relatively well. It collects information. But you'll see it still gets stuck in local minima. Because it can't plan all the way to get down to this other useful region, it just kind of sticks around here trying to collect information. So in a problem like the one that, that's, so that's the same, same setup, um, 
is that you need a sufficiently long horizon to, to get out of these local minima, but you never really know what that is until you tried them all. So that's not a very effective way of actually searching this tree. So another method is Monte Carlo tree search. I guess Andre knows a lot about this. But basically, in that case, what you do is you use a Monte Carlo approach where you roll out some random actions from where you are. So you say, OK, I'm going to take this option. And then from that point on, I'll see what happens. And then I'll work out how good that solution was. And I'll kind of back up credit from there. What that allows you to do is search more promising uh, areas of the search tree more rapidly. So I like this picture because it, it shows you you know, at the beginning, you're searching a lot. And then as you realize that more and more good solution seems to be over here, you start to search over there so that you get a better solution quicker. Um, and that helps you minimize, so not, not just destroy your computing time. So you know, with the finite horizon, once the horizon gets too big, it's exponential and it costs you too much. Um, so that helps you deal with trying to find this kind of neck of where you start to get really good returns, because picking this MCTS weight is ends up being easier than kind of running for a bunch of different horizons. Um, so that was OK, but it, it didn't quite solve the problem the way that we wanted to. And what we also realized is that inside each one of these information regions, it's like you're, you're doing all these local plans, and then you just want to connect them together. So it makes more sense to spend more computing power trying to get those local plans correct, and then working out the best sequence to go between them. So we created this thing called the cluster tree search, which basically clusters the information into these little separate. So we use a Gaussian mixture model, and it says, OK, I'll call this blob one cluster, and this blob some cluster, and this blob a third cluster. And then with each one of those, I can associate thermals. So there are certain sets of thermals so that the first one is up here, and those two ones are associated with that one, because they're the ones that actually help you explore that region. So then what you can do is say, well, this cluster has the most information in it, so I want to spend lots of time exploring that. And then I only have a much smaller search problem that says, OK, I'll only search around these, these ones labeled 2 in this region. Um, and I'll, I'll cover that region well, and then I just work out how to link them. So that's what we do. We search each of the clusters to get a good plan inside them. And then we use uh, dynamic programming to work out the best sequence between those and, and try and trim off any areas where you're not doing anything useful. Um, so yeah, you do a finite, try a finite horizon tree search, so it's similar to the previous one because it's fast inside each one of these because they're relatively small problems. And then you use dynamic programming to link those all together so that you get a long plan that covers <coughs> it all. So uh, we wanted to finally test some things. So we got a plane and learned how to crash them uh, and then how to fly them. Um, and so fortunately, one of the guys in our research group built his own autopilot. So this is a Skywalker UAV. It's about 1.8 meter wingspan. So this is not a glider, obviously. It's got a motor on the back. Um, the real challenge with doing this in the real sense with a glider is you don't really know enough information about where the thermals are. And we'll try and deal with that subsequently. But um, so this setting assumes that you can know where the thermals are. Yeah, so this is basically simulating a thermal by just turning the engine on at a certain location. So we say, if you're here, you turn the engine on, and you start to fly up again. And it's similar to the, otherwise, it's the same as the previous algorithm. The, the good thing about it is because this cluster tree search makes it much easier, you can compute it relatively quickly. So this has an onboard computer, and you can compute a new plan in, in about three seconds. Uh, so that means if thermals disappear or appear, you can, you can fix your plan. So that's what was <coughs> happening here. These graphs are kind of hard to see. It just flies around a lot. But um, this is, a th this is a, the initial plan. And then there's a thermal that appears, uh, or one that this, this one appears, thermal 2. And it kind of replans so that it actually uses that to, to get more useful information than it could have if it wasn't there. Um, and that was really just to show that it's fast enough that you can run it online. Uh, so again, we're back to having this problem of, well, things aren't static. We assume they're static, but they're not static. And disappearing and appearing is not really how thermals behave. They tend to move. But it makes the problem really hard. So once you start to have drifting thermals, so once these thermals are moving, you can't really do this easily association where you have that information cluster and you say these thermals are associated with it because it, the thermal kind of drops in and out of utility. So if I have this thermal here at A and it's moving and I have this cluster, at some time point it kind of, and this is the area that I want to search and this is how far I can search from the thermal. At some point in time, these things come in contact and from that time, this thermal is useful for exploring here and at some time it drops out again. So you have this 
like scheduling problem where now you've got windows where you can use the thermal to explore this region and after that it's gone again and it, it may be associated with something else. But uh, during that time, that, that's all you've got. So now your planning problem is, is kind of use the thermals that are available, uh, explore the clusters while you can using the, the, the estimates of what the thermals are doing and then you want to work out the best sequence of all of that. So you, you have this, um, what these plots, and I'll, I'll try and explain them because I use them later. Uh, so we've got the, on the, the vertical axis are the cluster indexes, so that's these little groups of information. And then you have some time when the thermal is actually available to help you, and we call it servicing because it's a, a scheduling problem, service the cluster. So you have to visit it in this time because that's the only time you've got a thermal available. And in some places you can sequence it so that you can kind of cover everybody. Sometimes, so in this case, the orange bar is the places where that's how long you would need to spend there to actually like finish the job to do all of the exploration you wanted to do. But in some cases, you can't do it. So we use a branch and bound technique to minimize this unservice time. So it's trying to make sure that you're not not servicing any of the clusters that you want to. Uh, and you get these like it starts to get really difficult to show these plots. But basically, you've got all these thermals and they're drifting along those lines there. And the glider starts at the circle, and its trajectory is this colored line, and it, it changes color over time. So it starts at blue and goes to red. Um, so what it's doing is it's using the thermals that are available. So it starts here, and this is cluster three. So there was a big blob of information that the black underlay here is after the mission is complete. So we've collected most of it. Um, but there was a big black one here, and a big one here, and a big one there. Um, so initially, it's using a couple of thermals, so it starts in cluster three and it's using, so the green bar is thermal A, which is this one. So it's using that one to explore and it's kind of following it along and then eventually it switches down to one, so it flies down here because these guys have drifted into the service region for this guy, so it flies around, it comes back and then it goes back. So this is a really hard scheduling problem because you've got to work out when you can get there and you know, you've know you got to get there in the time that it's available. Yeah? Result, you know that so, so the planner has the information yep. of the schedule? Yep. Okay. So in this case, we know where the thermals are and we know where they're drifting so that we can actually generate a good plan. But obviously that's a problem because you don't usually know where the thermals are. So if you wanted to find them, you get into this interesting problem uh, where, so let's say we have our glider and it's currently in a thermal and it's drifting in this direction. So we probably know how this one's drifting because we're, we're in it at the moment. And we have these two big information regions. So the, there's, there's one here that's not quite as good as this one. So we'd really like to explore this. But this thermal has a, a, an ellipse around it where if I go away and come back and meet it to where it's drifted to, you know, this is the kind of coverage region because it's moving. So I've, I've got this ellipse. So at the moment, I could exploit the current thermal. I can fly around inside there and use it to explore this region. Or I could try and explore and hopefully find a better thermal that allows me to explore this region over here. But you don't just want to explore randomly because there are certain places where you would really like to find a thermal because it'd be useful. So if I flew over here and I found a thermal useful because it'd allow me to service this thing, if I flew over here and found a thermal, and I'm assuming they're all drifting in the same direction, it wouldn't be that useful to me because there's nothing I really want to find over here. So if you kind of think about projecting these areas that you want to visit back into where you want to find a thermal, you know, this would be really useful. If I got over here and found a thermal, it would be great because it would drift in this region and I could do this whole job. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, we want to estimate the value of observing when you have this uncertain time dependency. So you really want to estimate the value of exploration, like how useful is it to go and sample this place. So we create this potential field that kind of tells you how useful it would be if you found something useful there. Um, and we solve an a analytic model for how the thermals drift. So we use an uncertainty model and say, if we know where it is now, we have some uncertainty over the direction it's heading, we can kind of project that forward. And this represents the probability of finding it if I went to go over here. Um, and then you use that to say, if this is my belief, so these are the things I want to find. I convolve it with this thing and I get these kind of sweeps behind it. So these are places where I'd really like to find thermals and the wind is going in this direction. So that if I got it here, I could pick it up and go and search this region that I care about. So this is giving us something that we can actually plan over. So now when I generate a plan, I want to collect, you know, I want to, when I explore, I want to go into explore in regions that are high and I don't really care about these blue regions. 
Uh, actually, doing that is, is quite difficult. So you, if you're in some thermal, you want to go and do an explore action. We, we do something similar to what I showed previously, where you plan a path back to the same one, and then you warp the points to collect information in areas that you think are going to be useful. And then you can use that in the same way with the previous planner to generate all this sequence of paths and go and find things. And you just get a big mess of paths. But basically, what we showed that if you don't know where the thermals are, sometimes you can find a, a good solution. So we compared it to a greedy one, where it just tries to get the best information it can at the time. Um, and if you run a whole bunch of simulations, you can get some idea of this. But basically, this is the full knowledge version. So if you have lots of knowledge, you can do really well. If you don't know, it ends up being dependent on, you really need to find thermals at the right time. And you don't know before you do it what you're going to find. So it, it's a difficult problem. Um, but this is a, like a competition matrix. So it says across each row how much better, how much time, or how often during these Monte Carlo simulations was this method better than the ones down here. So full knowledge is better than greedy and the, the search and explore most of the time. Uh, greedy very rarely beats the others. And the search and explore, you know, about a third of the time it beats greedy. So it's not doing that well. Um, and it's partially because it's just a hard problem. And greedy actually is not too bad if you don't have any information. But in general, it's, it's better. It's better than not doing it. So it seems like a reasonable thing to do. Um, what I'd really like to do with this, though, is, is incorporate more information. So because you really need to find the thermals, it'd be really good if you could predict where those thermals are going to be. So we had no prior over where thermals are. If you look at things that are on the ground that generate them, maybe you could get a better idea of that. Uh, so I think that's it for me, and I'll turn it over to Jen Jen. Um, yeah, do you want to do questions? Sure. Yeah. You uh, talked about thermals and so on. What sensors did you use? No, most of it seems like a simulation. What sensors yeah. did you use on the airplane, or did you, to have yeah. the airplane auto sense what's around it and so on? Yeah, so the mapping part is, is probably the hardest part. So we, we did two things. The first one on the test that you that you saw there, we, we actually did some attempted thermal detection. In that case, all you need is the airspeed and the vertical uh, velocity of the aircraft, which you can get from GPS and inertial. Um, and that allows you to get uh, basically a total energy estimate. So that's the way a Vario works on a manned glider. And it basically says, I'm collecting energy or I'm not. It doesn't really tell you which direction the wind is from, because you don't know. But something is happening so that I'm collecting energy. So you surmise the wind direction from the GPS. Yeah, so getting the wind direction is really hard. So to get the wind direction, you actually need to measure how the wind is, uh, is directed relative to the aircraft. So another thing that we did was to get a sensor that has um, air vanes, on, uh, like wind vanes. So it was a, a pitot tube that also has uh, directional sensors in two axes. And with that, you can get a wind vector. And the difference between how the wind is coming into the aircraft versus your inertial is actually due to the wind. So you can kind of try and back out the wind. And that's what I use in the simulation. I, I simulate noisy sensors on those two directions and the airspeed. Um, but that sensor package, we never, we never really got it tested well, because the only aircraft we could test it on was a piston-powered aircraft. And it was just too noisy. The aircraft moved too much. So that you just got noisy samples from these wind vanes, and you, you couldn't really get anything out of it. So unfortunately, I think you could only do that on a glider. Um, and we didn't have a glider that could carry that much payload for that sensor. Um, yeah, so I, I think you could do it, but it's really hard to say. Uh, the other way is a multi-hole pressure sensor. So if you measure the pressure on a sensor like above and below some surfaces, you can get an estimate of the wind direction from that. If you have a compass on it, you can do that probably. Yeah, so you, the hard part is you don't really know what part of it is due to the wind. Because the aircraft is moving, but you don't know whether it's because um, the wind is moving you in a certain direction or it's just the way the aircraft is flying. So getting the, the component that's just the wind versus the aircraft relative to the ground is the hard part. And for that, I think you do need um, uh, wind vector estimates. Unless, so if you had a really good model of the aircraft dynamics, you might be able to do it. Um, yeah. But e even then, I think you would want to know the air angles. Because you, you might know how much lift you're generating, but to, to back out you know, how much of that's your drag is you need to know your angle of attack, for example, to know, you know what your drag model says. And so yeah, if you had a really good aircraft model, maybe you could do it. Um, but I, I think that would be quite difficult. But for the thermal soaring stuff, you really only need that the total energy works fine. It, it doesn't 
doesn't matter too much because usually you're assuming it's all from thermals anyway. Um, and that's just the vertical. And that, so that, that hairy uh, scheduling problem. Sure. Uh, were you solving it in, in real time? Uh -huh. uh, no, so these, uh, no. <laughs> these plans uh, took, it depends on the problem complexity. So uh, I guess there's a plot on one of them. Um, Go back. So these ones, you, it takes a really long time to solve, depending on how hard you know you try to solve this thing. So this is in minutes. Um, oh. So if you want a good solution, fortunately the MCTS gets gets pretty good relatively quickly. So at some point, you know, really trusting these solutions doesn't matter so much. So you know, with a weight of down here, you can solve it in in the order of a few minutes. Um, but it gets high, well. So this is before you do the clusters, though. So once you, once you cluster it, it gets much easier. And that's how you could solve this part in real time, because you're only solving each local cluster, and it's small, and then you, you get it down to seconds. Um, it's a good question about once you add the scheduling. So the, you use a branch and bound solver to try and work out the schedule, and then um, you do something similar for the planning of the, each individual path using these little path option things. So this part's not too expensive. Um, you don't really, we don't really put complicated dynamics in here. It's just got a simple dynamics model to work out what a feasible trajectory looks like. And then the tree search. So yeah, I think you could solve this in minutes or less um, for a relatively long horizon. These are uh, 600 seconds or something like that. But I guess if you, so your distances there are in the order of a kilometer or so, yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, the glider covers the this distance in probably like less than but maybe a minute or so. Yeah. So it's not quite real. No. You will not be able to quite do it real. No. <coughs> the other thing, so you do spend some time in the thermal, so you know you can travel that distance, but some of the time you're just thermaling. Um, and during that time, you've got a bit of compute, so maybe. But yeah, you would definitely have to think about when you want to replan and when it's important to replan based on your information. Yeah, so the time makes things difficult really quickly. How are, you, how are you predicting where the thermals are? So we're assuming, so what we do is we have that, we assume things kind of drift together. So you can see all these lines are nearly parallel. So the, the green lines are the truth lines. But what we assume is that everything is moving roughly in the same direction. And then we just put an uncertainty. So that's why, that's why you get this nice smooth curve. So we have an uncertainty over the heading of it. So we say, we think it's going in this direction at this speed, but we have a, you know, just a Gaussian over what its heading could be. So you get it kind of drifting out over the time. So, you know, this, I don't know if people understand this plot, but basically there's a the thermal here that we know about. And then over time, we're looking at where it could be in the future and the, the likelihood that it'll be there, or in particular, that if we go there, we would find it. Um, Visual cues? No, and I, I think that would be really useful. So we're just assuming that you have to fit, like physically move the aircraft there to measure it. Um, but if you had multiple aircraft, it would be really useful to share information, of course. And yeah, you're right. There are visual cues on the ground and the types of clouds. So that's one of the things we stuck in here. If you, if you could fuse information, I think it would make the problem much easier. It would definitely be something worth trying. Yeah. So what kind of computation did you have on board? Like so this is uh, basically a mobile phone board. Uh, I don't remember it was a few years ago, but it was like a Galaxy S1 or something. You used to be able to buy those like Odroid boards. Odroid. Yeah, sorry, that's right. It's a, anyway, in the picture, yeah. Any questions? So yeah, we have a bit of kind of future work stuff at the end, but we'll see yeah. if we get to it. All right, so Nick talks a lot about um, the wind mapping side of things, the aerodynamic side of things, and then how you would use gliding in terms of uh, an external mission where you want to use gliding as one of the tools that allows you to um, achieve your mission task. Uh, the problem that I looked at for my uh, PhD thesis was more on how you will learn the actual control policy. So a little bit lower level in terms of how you would actually do um, the soaring. So I guess Nick's gone over most of this, but the motivating problem is that we have this 
reasonably large dimensional problem where we have either 12 or 13 states, depending on if you're using um, the angles or the quaternions. And you have these three actions that you can take uh, where you move your ailerons, your elevator, or your rudder, and they end up being these uh, pitch rates or um, roll rates. And then what you're trying to do is work out what is the best combination of these things to do in each particular state. So if I have this thermal here, which has this uh, rising column of hot air, and I'm approaching it as a glider, what's the best thing to do? Should I try and fly through it um, every single time? Should I try and circle around it, which is what a lot of uh, man gliders do, and it's what we know typically has been shown to work very well? Or is it worth trying to explore an entire range of different um, control actions that could teach us better control strategies? Um, and whether or not we could learn control policies that look like what we see um, man gliders doing, RC pilots doing, uh, simply using a black box learner. So the problems, there's a couple of challenges in the problem. The first is that it's really large state action space. Uh, it's not only high dimensional, but it's also continuous in, uh, in the problems that we're considering. So uh, the other problem is, of course, that your platform is constrained by the amount of energy that it has. So without uh, applying this in some sort of uh, online learning, if you're trying to do that, either because you're doing transfer learning, you've done some amount of learning and simulation, and now you want to do the actual implementation on board, you want to be able to do some transfer learning at that point. Um, in any case where you're actually uh, running this learning on the platform, you have these resource constraints that you have to think about. Because the amount of energy that you have on the platform really restricts uh, what you can actually do in the environment. So there are these hard limits on the affordable exploration, which means that we have to be uh, a lot more judicious about how we choose where we explore to. So we want these three properties where we want exploration to be directed uh, in terms of we want our exploration to go to places where we actually think we're going to get a lot more information. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we want it to be non-myopic, which means that not only do I want to know what's the next best step, I would like to know what the next few best steps are. Because if I'm going to be restricted about where I can fly to in the future, I really need to have a longer look ahead horizon because of that. And we also want it to be adaptive in two ways. So the first way is related to this uh, information gathering problem, where uh, as we collect more samples, the information drops in some places. We assume submodularity across uh, the surface of our um, value function. But we also want it to be adaptive in terms of the amount of energy that we have on the platform. So when the energy is high, so either we're at a high altitude or we're flying very quickly, then perhaps we want to be more aggressive in our exploration. But if energy is low, then those are the cases where you want to be uh, more conservative about how you explore and whether or not you should be doing something that's more exploitative in that matter. So uh, because the energy component of this problem gave us a really nice reward function because it gave us a gradient of good actions. Uh, and not only um, in a lot of learning problems, you only ever get that one signal at the very end after you've done a whole series of actions and then it tells you you've done the right thing. Um, in gliding or in soaring, you get this continuous reward function that, give, uh, that returns a signal to you that gives you this gradient of uh, how well you're performing. And so because of that, we thought it'd be really nice to try and approach it from a reinforcement learning uh, framework. So I think most of you are familiar with this. So I think this slide will just be about getting through the notation so you, um, all the rest of the stuff makes sense. Um, but the method I, that I implemented was a SARSA lambda reinforcement learning algorithm. And SARSA stands for reward, uh, state action, reward, state action, where you start your system in some state. You, have a, you sample your value function to work out what your next action should be. Uh, you receive some sort of reward for making that transition into the next state. And then you, again, sample from your objective function to work out what your next action should be. So I, uh, this is typically, this j here is typically the same as your q value function. Um, but of course, if you want to do some sort of augmentation on top of that, which is what we'd like to do, um, then you would sample from that function instead. And so from there, then you can update what your estimated uh, key values are, and then you continue this process uh, and hopefully learn what your control policy is going to look like by uh, reading it back out from your value function. So the update equation is pretty simple. Uh, this alpha here is your learning step parameter, which tells you how much you want to correct your current estimate is based on your uh, new information. The delta is the temporal difference error, which looks at what your current estimate of uh, the value function is for the next state action versus what you expected it to be. And then I use a replace trace function uh, in the following experiments anyway uh, to look at how we can uh, do credit assignment back along the trajectory. 
And uh, I think for this work anyway, I remember Jonathan Howe's group was also doing something very similar. And he was approaching it from a Q learning perspective. And we had a few disagreements about whether or not we should do online learning versus, uh, sorry, on policy learning versus off policy learning. Um, but I think the value of doing it with an on policy learning framework is that you get that trace information, which is important when you're talking about full trajectories and not just single step actions. And unfortunately, for something like Q learning, you lose that information every time you explore. And especially at the start of learning, you would, uh, you would definitely cut that information down and you wouldn't be able to apply that credit assignment back um, as easily as if you did it uh, using this method. So the problem, of course, was that standard uh, or traditional reinforcement learning was based on a tabular or discrete state action space. And so your value function was limited by how expressive it could be about the entire um, problem space. So the typical methods or the traditional methods for doing reinforcement learning weren't able to handle these large state action space problems, which is what we have in this problem. So uh, the methods that people have come up with uh, in order to address this was to use value function approximation. And uh, the method that we chose to use, because in ACFR we have a, <laughs> we have a culture of using GPs, so we use the GP to try and model uh, our value function. So in this case, our training inputs were our state actions, and our training targets were just the values um, that we would learn and um, uh, update as we went along. Um, and so we would get our GP mean, which would give us our estimated value function, but it would also give us an idea of what the uncertainty was on based on that estimate. And this was useful because if we're going to do something like exploration, we want a metric over that to work out how much information we would actually expect to get in order to get the best estimate we can of the actual value function. So the information measures, there's a few available out there that are kind of standard. You have you know, the trace, the entropy, those sort of things. Um, unfortunately, they don't scale very well with the size of the problem. So uh, what I looked at was to consider what the volume that it actually sweeps out over the space looks like. So if this is our estimated, if the colored surface is what our estimated value function is, then the GP covariance uh, is, can be represented by this sort of shaded tissue that's squashing it underneath. And so it sweeps out this volume. And as, the, as we take more samples and as our uncertainty decreases, that volume also decreases. And so the nice thing about this is uh, you can actually express this analytically. And if you, make some, uh, if you make some assumptions about what your covariance function looks like, and in the following, uh, and in yeah, all the ones that I did in following this, I use a squared exponential, which is uh, nice and, uh, to use in general. If you make some assumptions about the integrability of your covariance function, then you can actually solve for uh, v analytically. And that really cuts down, because then you're not limited um, by how many samples you're taking, how large the problem is, all those things. You have one function that you can query, and it's a constant uh, computation time for that. So yeah, so this became the information gain that we looked at when we were thinking about how we would actually do this exploration and how to quantify the value of exploration in that case. So uh, we would look at the change in the information gain based on how much this volume shrank, um, depending on whatever potential samples we took in the state action space. So uh, just to compare against these existing metrics, this again is the surface looking now from above, from the previous one that we saw before. And uh, just a kind of a small demonstration just to do a sanity check to make sure that everything was the way that we thought it was. Um, we sampled it at 20 different places and we wanted to see how the uh, information uh, would change, how the uncertainty would change as we made these samples. And so we compared against the trace and the entropy and we can see that the volume does in fact represent a, uh, a proportional value to all of the other existing metrics. So it was giving us the right information. It was giving us the right signal. And so what was nice, though, is um, we don't only want to look at what the sequential thing is after an entire series of samples. We want to look at how informative the next sample is going to be. And this is what uh, this one is showing over here. So this is saying that my, very, my second sample is going to be worth this much information, and so on for all of our moves. Uh, all the other following samples. And you can see this sort of submodularity as we get more and more samples and more dense as we get around there. 
And so if we look at the computation time, though, it's really nice because this variance volume, we had an analytical solution. So it doesn't change with the number of samples that we take. But for the trace and entropy, because we're doing that matrix operation, we have this squared, uh, the ON squared term inside there when we're trying to work out um, what's, when we sample the GP covariance with more and more test points, this um, becomes more and more expensive. And this becomes important because later on, the sort of learning uh, that we do on top of it in, pre in the search to lambda is going to actually require a lot, of, uh, a lot of iterations over it. So any amount of savings that you can make is actually worth quite a lot. Do you have an example of the expression? Uh, I don't think I have it on here. Uh, it's, not, it's not pretty. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, error functions in there that you have to solve for. Yeah, so error functions don't have a, uh, I guess you would call it a track analytical solution, but there are definitely tractable uh, um, approximations to it that are very, very good. How is it related to log determinant of the covariance matrix? Sorry? So the variance volume. Mm -hmm. So I can take a covariance matrix and just compute the log determinant. Mm -hmm. And that would give me a volume measure of the uncertainty. Okay. Right. I mean, I'm just, uh, the, just, just curious. So that would be like the determinant where you try yeah, to work out yeah. the yeah. volume of each point. This yeah. is over the act the physical space that if you were to plot it over the top, like you saw yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of slides back, yeah. it's actually showing you how it shrinks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm just curious what's the relationship between yeah, the I, different proxy and out and things like yeah. that. I would assume, because we compared it against the entropy, which is like a proxy for the determinant um, up the top, and it looks like it's some sort of proportionality compared to it. I don't know what exactly the relationship is, and I think it's probably worth trying to find out, especially for other um, types of covariance matrices. So, oh, sorry, covariance functions. So with a squared exponential, you get this nice solution, but as you go to more descriptive ones, like the neural network, for example, it's not integrable. So you now have this problem of now you have to estimate the integral as well as all these other things. So it doesn't become as useful if you don't have that property. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. So yeah. Is the objective here to learn control for a given thermal, or is it to learn general control strategy that you would apply to any thermal? Yeah. Have? So for for the test that I ran, um, we have no knowledge of what the thermal looks like or where it is in the space. So it should be um, applicable to a range of different wind values. So we don't need to know what the wind looks like. We don't need to know anything about the profile of the wind, where the thermal happens to be. It's really the only signals that you need are what is my current state and what is the energy that, I'm, uh, that I've tr received over this transition, and that's it. So it should be, uh, you should be able to adapt this to whether it's static soaring or dynamic soaring, but we only have tested it on static soaring. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's challenging, right? Because as we know, even with human pilots, it's not, it's, a lot of it's based on intuition that they can't even describe to us. So being able to capture it with a learning algorithm remains to be proven. So yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges there. Yes. Could, you, uh, could you explain what the state of action is uh, for your policy? Sure. So uh, the states, it will come a little bit later on, but I'll um, talk through it now. The states we reduced down, so we have our standard 12 states where we have X, Y, Z, P, Q, R, and all the angles associated with it. Um, but what we notice is that if you're doing static soaring, um, you can reduce it down to relative um, relative states. So if you have some estimate as you're flying through, if you can estimate where you think the center is, then because you make an assumption that the thermal is, um, is in the polar coordinates, at least symmetrical, then all you need to know is your relative distance to where you think the center is and your relative bearing to where you think the center is. And that should give you enough information because it doesn't matter whether if the thermal center is here. If you're flying this way through it versus if you're flying this way through it, it's going to look exactly the same. Because the control action that you do should uh, match all the way around if it's symmetrical. Yeah. And even if it's ablated or squished out in any sort of way, then again, it will be a matter of um, trying to engineer those states to be as descriptive as possible without having all these redundant ones uh, that are sort of clogging up your state action space. And the thermal do you estimate this or you know it a priori? Uh, you, can, so you can do either. So if you know it a priori, it's definitely better. If you don't, then there are methods that other people have looked at. So I think it was, was it Michael Allen and Dan Edwards? When they, uh, in the soaring, the RC soaring example, they did a Kalman filter over where they thought the center of the thermal was. 
And so there's a couple of uh, existing, I think it's for RC pilots, there's a couple of existing rules of thumb that allow them to work out where the center is and then to work out the best bank angle for that. And then they sort of backed it out and used a Kalman filter to estimate where the center of the thermal would be. Is it related to the information you're gathering? Like um, for the, the information you're gathering, does it give you more information about the thermal center? Um, not in this one, although that's a good idea. So in this one, it's simply looking at uh, just the state extreme space as I've described it. So without um, including the notion of whether or not my estimate of where the thermal center is is correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, we talked about wanting to have a non-myopic exploration. So um, the way that we approached that end of the problem was uh, with Sarsa Lambda uh, and Q Lambda as well learning, you have, this uh, you have this temporal credit assignment where you use the lambda value to back up all the states and actions along the trajectory that allowed you to uh, arrive at this point. But information, of course, we're looking into the future about what we could potentially see. And because uh, in your, when you're flying, the amount of energy that you have is going to limit the sort of space that you can explore as you go ahead. So you want to be very certain that you're going somewhere that will allow you to explore a broader range of things. So we looked ahead, instead of going back, we thought, what happens if you roll out into the future and see what happens in that case? And so um, in order to do that, we did, a, uh, we did a state action rollout, which looked at what would happen if I was to take this particular action, how much information would that uh, allow me to um, receive at that point? And then once I'm there, what actions are now available to me and what information is now available to me? And we rolled that out um, to a threshold discount value, which said at this point, it's not going to make any difference because uh, it's too far into the future to know what happens. So in the little inset up the top here, what you see is what it would look like in the physical world if we had some perfect um, sort of state lattice trajectories. So the first action that we take would be to uh, bank towards the right. And then that would open up that area of the space for us. And then if we were to go forward, there would be a different area of the state action space. And again, if we bank to the left, it would give us um, a different set of achievable state actions. OK, so we have the I value now, which is our exploration value. So how much information can I gain? How much can I reduce my uncertainty about the control policies that I currently think are the best? And we also have our exploitation objective, which is our, the mean that we backed out of the GP function estimation. And so the problem with just having those two values is that they have very different scales. <laughs> so at least with the, um, at least with the information game, it's really hard to tell what exactly that scaling is, especially if we account for the submodularity that we expect as we go forward, that value is going to continue to shrink. And at some point, if we don't normalize, then we will no longer want to explore. It will never be better than the key values that we have. So we normalize. Um, and then uh, we want to combine them in a way that's not going to jeopardize our learning. So the, uh, the sort of paradigm around reinforcement learning is that if you take repeat observations of the same state actions, you will always get the same reward. Now, with submodularity of the information, that's not true. Because as you uh, reobserve the same piece of information, that becomes less and less valuable. So we don't want to incorporate it into the actual backup of the, um, of the learning algorithm. And instead, we used it to guide our objective function for how we actually sample the, state, uh, the actions that we take. So we would weight it. We would weight these two values um, in two different ways. And the first was just assuming that uh, over time, we want to reduce the amount of exploration that we do. So it was a very simple one where we just did a time step weighting, uh, and they look like these exponentials as they decay over here. And then the other one was to look at what happens if we actively consider the amount of energy that we have on board. So this is saying that if I have more energy, then I can be more aggressive about exploration. And uh, this is also including the altitude that I'm at. So even if I'm at a... Um, at a low altitude, even if I have a lot of energy, I still don't want to be aggressive because that could be potentially quite bad. Um, but if I'm at a high altitude with low energy, you know, maybe I have enough energy that I can allow myself to explore. And so um, across the sort of altitude energy space, this is the gradients that we see of um, how likely we are to weight, or how highly we weight exploration versus exploitation. And so obviously, as we go up into this top right-hand corner, we are more aggressive as we explore. Okay, and so the action selection objective is very simple. We just add these two things together. We weight them according to either our time step weighting or energy weighting, and then um, we sample our actions through there. So 
I know this is kind of a nasty slide, but if you've seen Sarsa before, you'll notice that a lot of these are exactly the same. And all we're doing is we're adding a couple of extra steps. So we now estimate the Q values for each of our, um, at each of our learning steps using our GP. We then perform the state action rollout to work out what our potential information gain would be for each action. We compute the objective function, we select the next action, and then we update our GP training targets. And that's basically just folded into the standard SASA learning um, framework. So uh, again, we tested this in simulation on a toroidal thermal model. And it's a little bit stre more stretched out than the one I'm showing you here. But um, we're basically modeling it on this 3D wind where we have a column in the middle which has strong rising air, uh, and it's displacing this wind around it, which is rolling around. So we have um, total, uh, total conservation of the momentum of all the wind. And uh, like I said before, we have these states relative to the thermal center. So we're looking at how far away we are, we think we are from the center of the thermal and how fast we're going, as well as the relative bearing. So the action set um, is similar to the one that you saw in Nick's work where you have the nine, um, the nine potential actions. So you can either go straight, bank left or right. You can climb, bank left or right, or you can uh, go down, bank left or right. There's a specific angle, fixed angle at which you bank. Uh, it's a rate. No, yeah. a real, yeah, specific yeah. rate. Yeah, there's a specific rate. And so we're really just sampling from these nine different actions. And so uh, we calculate the reward as just the amount of energy change that we get for both our potential energy and the kinetic energy. OK, so this is just a video of the sort of learning episodes as they go along. The first few episodes are pretty quick because it hasn't learned anything yet, so it just sort of flies through and then escapes. But you'll notice that by around episode 20, it's starting to do something a little bit more intelligent. So yeah, again, I think we use the same um, aerodynamics model, I believe, for this one as uh, that you saw in the previous ones. Yeah, so you have the rising column in the middle, and then slowly as this uh, learns, you start to see more of this circling action as it learns that um, that's the way that it's going to gain a lot more energy. You're assuming that you have some sort of a reset capability. Yeah, yeah it's episodic. This yeah. has to happen in simulation because you wouldn't want to fly this on a real plane yet. <laughs> Not yet. You can do, I, I like the idea of transfer learning, which is where you start to learn a control policy that in simulation you can at least say, under these conditions, we expect it to behave um, in a sensible manner. And then set it out into a more controlled environment, perhaps one where you can uh, control where the thermals are if you set up ground features to, in order to generate those thermals. Um, and then demonstrate on there, learn on there, where you have gusts and other, other disturbances. And then hopefully uh, you know, adapt whatever you've learned in the simulation where everything's perfect to a more sort of rigorous environment. Have, have you had any su what success with that? Because the big in an application, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, no, is <laughs> the short answer. So it was it's something that we would like to try, but um, the test range actually that we have is very windy. And I'm not sure why we test there, but uh, we, we have it available to us. So it, it's in the middle of the valley, it's quite windy. But the idea uh, was at some point to um, set up either ground features, so something really large and black, for example, and let it heat up over the day so that you would know. Yeah, you know that there's a thermal here. There's a prevailing wind. Yeah, so if you have a prevailing wind, you can work out where that prevailing wind is and at least have some idea of where the column's going. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of other features in that test range. For example, the we have a large shed, which is just this big metal structure, and you could always, around afternoon, you would expect to get thermals rising from there. Yeah, and that's, that is how we would have liked to have tested, but we never got around to it. For your uh, kinetic energy component, mm -hmm. are you taking into account just the vertical um, amount of energy being exhibited, or are you also in including the horizontal velocity? Yes. So the kinetic only looks at the velocity, I think. The potential is the one capturing how the altitude, yeah. So I can't remember exactly how we calculate it, but all of those states go into it to work out what the total energy change is. So that, I'm just curious because the um, you can measure the, the kinetic you know rise or decreasing um, rate of lift, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but then you know your forward velocity has 
potential energy yeah. absorbed in there as well that yeah. you can use to, to zoom solar, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not sure how rigorous the simulation is compared to what we would actually observe on a real system. So I think um, at least as an initial model, this was, this gave us sensible behaviors that look like something that you would expect. It wasn't doing something incredibly wild. So um, it, it was something that was sufficient, <laughs> let's say. Yeah, so if we look at the aerial view of the trajectories, um, you start to see this exploration behavior. So at the start, before it's gotten a good idea of what's happening, it's sort of flying around uh, and doing these sort of wa uh, wider uh, exploratory motions. What you see in episode 50 is kind of interesting, which we notice later, is you get these uh, helical structures where it starts in the center because it's flying over here. It flies into the uh, sides and it starts to do these spirals out the side so that it can capture more of the state action space while still being within uh, that structure and allowing it to gain energy. So it was interesting. It was something that we didn't expect. Okay, so when we looked at just comparing against all these other um, different types of learning algorithms, uh, it was nice to see that ours ended up flying for the longest <laughs> um, across the simulation, so that was good. Compared to standard learning algorithms, they weren't able to do, perform as well. And uh, the best thing about it was that we were able to actually succeed in flying out through the top of the structure um, more times than all of the other learning algorithms, which is good. And if we look at the learn value function over the, uh, so this is the Q value function for a range of, let's see, uh, distances to the thermal center. This across the bottom is the bearing towards the center of the thermal. And this is for, this is, I'm going to show you for different velocities. So this is for the stall velocity, so right down the bottom of the stall velocity. Um, what you can notice is that you want to be close. <laughs> what it learns is that it wants to be close to the center of the thermal. And that being, about zero degrees at that point is good because you're flying very slowly and you want to get to the center of the thermal so you can get as much energy as possible. And you also notice that there's this symmetry of uh, that wraparound because uh, we didn't explicitly place it into the learning algorithm, but it did um, learn that it was symmetrical. So at minus 180 is the same as uh, being at 180 degrees of a heading towards the thermal center. So as you go up, you see this structure change uh, quite dramatically at this point. I think this is the first time that it actually aborts by uh, flying through the bottom of the structure of the learning space. And so you get these really large negative areas where it's like you really don't want to be flying 90 degrees and this far away from it. So uh, this sort of zero line shows you the area that the thermal is useful to the glider in. So it tells you you can learn exactly how far away you can be away from it and it tells you what sort of angles you want to be facing. So you really don't want to be flying at a tangent at a high speed because you're just going to exit the space. OK, so I guess the conclusions to wrap up for both uh, Nick and I's work is like over the, I guess, five to six years that ACFR has been working on it, we've, we've developed a pretty good understanding of the mechanics of soaring. And so we know that now that wind estimation is basically the largest challenge of it because you get these point samples that you have to physically go and be in that location to, to sample. Um, all of the demonstrations that we've done and most of the work that we've done has been in theory and in simulation. And uh, the most challenging part is being able to conduct these experiments because it's very difficult to get the truth data ahead of time. Um, and whether or not that's even useful is another question. Um, and I guess future research directions. Nick, did you want to? Jump back in for this. Is there any? <laughs> um, yeah, I, maybe a little bit, but you know, I think you, keeping it online is important. So some of these things, like the reinforcement learning, is nice because you have this really general approach, but you can't fly 50 missions where you crash 49 of them. That's not. We have an engine. You can yeah, you right. can abort. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and I guess. Doing something where you know when to abort is also good because mm. you can actually keep trying. Um, so yeah, having an engine, having having a test case where you can actually repeatedly test something. Um, I think it'd be a really interesting problem with multiple vehicles. Kind of fusing information from multiple vehicles, I think, would give you a good map. That would be something cool to do. Um, and generally, both of us, so we don't do soaring anymore, um, but we're still kind of interested in these active exploration problems, especially resource-constrained ones. Um, so I don't. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so again, it's not just the two of us working on it. Yeah. Um, these are all the people from ACFR who were involved. So Salasu so Kuru was the supervisor of both Nick and myself. Um, Joe was the student whose work that you saw with the soaring with the mission work. Uh, Dan, student who worked on the autopilot that we all used. And I think he uh, successfully, his work was on... Um, air to air um, refueling. So he was yes. interested in, in uh, actually uh, docking. docking two drones in flight. And he demonstrated that. Yeah, and he snuck in right before uh, the cool. Air Force did it. So yeah. he was able to claim that he was the first person to do so, it. Yeah, you, you can have a look at the video on the internet, but yeah, it's it pretty kind exciting. of flies. And he's got the, this is what this is. This is a drogue that's towed behind a previous one and it kind of docks. It's yeah, so cool. both planes are autonomous. Yeah. And his supervisor as well was Ali Goktagan, who worked a lot on the hardware with him. And uh, Rob Fitch, also still at ACFR, was working a lot on the information gathering exploration problem. And Chen Yao Yu was also um, one of the students that worked with him on that. I think that's yeah, and I it. think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess we answered a few questions throughout, but if you have any more, we'd be happy to discuss it now. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed it. Stuck up for a second. Um, so when you're doing the calculation, like so, you're you're weighing like you know in your receiving rise and the trees that you come yeah. up with. You're weighing the cost of like you know, um, so there's like the, the cube like you know the exploit, and then there's the information mm -hmm. gain, which is the explore uh, part, and then you are trading them off. But um, there's also this cost of like taking the trajectory, yes. right? And how do you like like I could take a let's say I take a very expensive trajectory and it gives me a huge information gain, but I may be in a state of like no return. Like I may have gained right. all the information, but I am like. Done. Yeah. So um, in order to do the rollouts, it needs to have, uh, I guess I didn't specify this, but it needs to have a model of what it's capable of as well. So as it does the rollout, it's not just saying, um, what's the information I'm going to get by doing this? It's, is this actually feasible? And if that is the case, then what's the information I'll get? So uh, I don't know that I explicitly cut it off in the boundaries or uh, if it does something that um, it actually exits, whether or not um, I cut the information off in that case. I think that's what I did instead of um, just saying no. It just gets a zero information gain reward for that. So it will roll out according to its internal model of the, um, of the aircraft, where it would expect to be if it tried to execute this particular action. And it would get very little information or zero information if it exited the um, learning state action space. Yeah. Okay. How far uh, on those on that, those exploration steps? Yes. Um, I think you showed maybe like three. Yeah. Three steps uh, ahead. How far do you? So it depends on how you set that gamma parameter because it decays over time. I think uh, feasibly, if you set a gamma parameter to something like zero point nine, you would get values that would work up to like the fifth rollout, fourth or fifth rollout before it stopped being useful at all. Yeah. And do you have any um, you know sort of? Have you run simulations to kind of look at um, like where that falls off in, in at least a simulated experiment? Oh, good question. No, I haven't. Okay. So, yeah, so if you just look at, because you're weighting all of these information values according to the gamma, you can just look at the what gamma squared, gamma cubed, et cetera, looks like. And by the point that it's like you're down to 10 to the minus 3 or 4 or 5, it's not making any difference. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I'm trying to understand why you framed it in the RL framework. Mm -hmm. um, so to contrast, uh, there's been some work in Andreas Cross's group where they look at information gathering with budget constraints mm -hmm. and frame it as a non-myopic path planning problem and then keep replanning mm -hmm. as they gain more and more information. So how would you, what would be the benefit of not going down that paradigm instead of learning a Q function? Yeah, uh, good question. So we. Well, I chose to do the RL framework because I thought that with the energy as the reward function, you had a really nice structure that would give you gradations of how good it was. And you weren't always looking for an optimal path or an optimal policy. You wanted something that was good enough um, a lot of the time. And so you're not guaranteed to get the optimal policy in this case uh, for various reasons with the approximations and so on rolled into it. But uh, what you can show is that you get a policy that's good enough that allows you to gain energy and do more things with that. With the budget constraints, it's definitely something that you could consider for a problem like this. It fits very nicely. I don't know how some of those guarantees roll over into it when um, your ability to, uh, the things that you actually observe 
um, change your budget. Yeah. So I don't know how that would uh, fit into it, but it's definitely something that if you could solve that problem, that would go in some way towards solving yeah. the soaring problem. Yeah. yeah. Fixed. Yeah. Otherwise, there can decrease. It's the dynamic. Or, or decrease. Yeah. That yeah. is the trick. Exactly. So your budget is a function of what you observe. Sure. I mean, they, yeah. so their inform. I mean, their objective function also a function of what they observe, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not really different. They they get around it by replanning. Yeah. Um. So I was wondering what the. Yeah. I was just wondering what this paradigm offers. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a different way of doing it. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say that one is particularly better than another. I don't know that that's emerged yet. Yeah. No, I mean, for certain problems, it, um, you would get similar behaviors if you did um, policies, which mm -hmm. looked at the current belief yeah. to action versus uh, doing this deliberative planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if this is such an application where it makes sense to do what you're doing uh, rather than <laughs> expensive um, solving this orienteering expensive problem. Yeah, I, I mean, this is also expensive. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, this takes a long time to just run. Um, I don't know, really. I kind of fell into it. One, because Nick had started working on it, and uh, he couldn't work on it anymore, so he told me to do it, so I did. <laughs> um, and uh, I think as, as a learning problem, it's interesting, because from just from the learning side of things, all of the benchmarking problems, all the toy problems that you test on, like mountain car, cart pole, all that stuff, you only ever get that one signal at the end. And, you know, it makes it very generalizable to a lot of other problems. But now if we if we have more information, if we have gradations towards a good solution, you know, should we rethink how we actually do our learning? Yeah. I think personally I really like the learning approach because like you know in the in that world that you're referencing, like you have to like really write down the objective and then you are constrained to that objective, mm -hmm. right? Like what if that objective is not true in like that's not what a expert human pilot would do yeah. or or the right so so this like you know really frees you up to yeah it like, makes you know, fewer assumptions about the problem itself. right meaning at the cost of increased um simulations yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. but yeah it would be interesting to see if you can do like you know bootstrap this q learning with yeah. imitation learning mm -hmm. like get an expert human pilot to yeah yeah so yeah, it'd be really nice if you could see those like value functions too, because starting from nothing or uniform or whatever you start from, it's not really like that. We do have a reasonable idea how to do some of this stuff, and especially you know like the the transfer idea as well. You, once you've learned this, you want to take that somewhere else. Even when the environment changes, it's probably close to being the right thing. So you want to start from that and then build on it. And you could do that with a, with an expert too. If an expert builds a policy for you, you should be able to put it in there and use it from that point. But yeah, I guess we didn't didn't quite get there. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you.